Hello and welcome. This is a very uh, special conversation that I am so honored to host for so many reasons. Uh, whether or not you have had the opportunity to see uh, the film uh, that we have made available to the community um, until May 3rd, 2022, um, through uh, GLI's website um, and through some of our other social media, you should be able to find the link um, to the movie, The Burden of Genius, uh, which is the story of Dr. Thomas Starzl, who's known as the father of transplantation. Um, you'll have that opportunity if you haven't seen it before this panel, you can absolutely watch it after. Um, but what we wanted to use this opportunity uh, today is um, during uh, both um, donation, uh, Donate Life Month, uh, focusing on organ donation and transplantation and Minority Health Month, um, you know, something I, I feel that the, the intersection of is so important. Um, we wanted to have a, a conversation about uh, going from the burden of genius and Dr. Tar Starzl's story to the benefit of genius, how we can create an equitable organ donation and transplant system. Uh, many of you know me, uh, Donna Cryer. I am CEO of the Global Liver Institute, um, but also a uh, transplant recipient of 27 years and counting. So I have certainly received uh, the great blessing and benefit of this genius. And I have with me Dr. Nicole Golden from the Liver Health, uh, Black Liver Health Initiative and uh, Mr. Edward Drake uh, from the organization Why Not. Um, we do hope that Dr. Lint Johnson uh, from GW's uh, Center for Liver and Pancreas Quality um, uh, will also be joining us he is doing uh, the very first transplant um, of his new uh, center there at, at George Washington University today, um, uh, but still made the commitment to try to join us if he could. And so we hope to add him to this conversation. Um, certainly having had the opportunity to staff him um, in my early days post-transplant while I was working for the United Network for Organ Sharing, um, and he was head of the Minority Affairs Committee. Um, he has so many wonderful insights on uh, the evolution of transplantation that I do hope we can join us. But we will not suffer for uh, things to talk about. Um, Nicole, I will start with, with you about how you became involved um, in these issues of organ donation and transplant equity um, and the barriers that your organization helps people overcome. Thank you, Donna. And uh, it is such an honor and pleasure uh, to be here today to really talk about organ uh, transplant and donation. And this has always been a passion of mine. Um, I always say that I, I, I was hired um, at my current position because my, uh, my, my main interview point was that I love the liver. Um, <laughs> Um, I was introduced to liver transplant. Um, it was my first uh, nursing job in my career 20 something years ago. Um, and I was amazed at how patients can come in so very, very sick um, on the brink of death, basically, um, and recover. So, you know, a lack of better terms, miraculously, from the gift of organ transplant. Um, I believe that once you've experienced that type of contrast, it's very hard to go back and do it. <laughs> um, I might be a little biased in that. Um, <clears throat> so I spent many years um, working in organ transplants, um, working in the ICU, and I think all of that really helped to mold my, um, my respect for this field. Um, in the ICU, patients would be very, very sick. Um, and then they would go in for their transplants. And, you know, the recovery isn't overnight, but we right. definitely see um, basically like a scientific miracle, right? That's what I'm going right. to call it um, because it's science and there's mm -hmm. a lot of miracles happening uh, in between the way as well. Um, my work with organ equity and transplant equity, I would say dates back to about two years. Mm -hmm. um, we really started to, at our center, really look at, you know, 
the issues that are preventing them from you know, coming trans in general. Um, there is always been a shortage of organs. Uh, we still have that problem. I believe we will always have that, um, that problem. And I think that is the first disparity, right? That we don't have mm -hmm. the match a demand. Um, and that's where the first um, disparity begins. Um, but really looking at, especially in minorities, because this is a group that has, <clears throat> you know, not as not as much access to organ transplant, what it is that's preventing that access? Is it that they're aware that transplant is possible? And some people are not, believe it or not, mm -hmm. in in time? Um, is it certain barriers that prevents them from getting to an mm -hmm. organ uh, transplant site? Or is, is it something uh, that has been with us for a long time? You know, medical mistrust. Um, it's still very prevalent. Um, and we saw it play out in a very major way during the COVID-19 pandemic, and which we're actually still going through, <laughs> um, that has created, you know, I say like the old, our old, um, our old sins or, you know, mm -hmm. things that happened in the past um, mm -hmm. still really affecting affecting us today. Um, so it's always been something that has been dear to my heart and I've been able to team up with um, two of my other colleagues at the Center for Liver Disease and Transplant as well as our entire uh, transplant program to really look at um, access issues and awareness issues and, and getting people in the door um, there are so many people that are still out in the community that we really can't even account for that have mm -hmm. not been in contact with maybe even a local gastroenterologist, which is kind of like a pathway mm -hmm. or a local hepatologist, which usually is a pathway to get to a transplant center. So those are things that we're looking at. Um, you know, I, I think about the work of Clive Callender from, you know, way back when mm -hmm. in the 70s and how mm -hmm. he was pioneer for looking at things and really right. not just looking at it and seeing the problem, but also being a part of the solution. And mm -hmm. that is what we are here for, not to just talk about it, <laughs> but to be a part of the solution. And it's a all hands on deck solution. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just for this group of people or that group of people. If there's an, a problem and as medical providers um, and, and even like a uh, people who are supportive in the community, we all need to come together. It's 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 that big um, and, and that much work that needs to be done that it, it's more than one group of people. So I'm very excited that, you know, at our center, <clears throat> we've all come together to really rally and, and look at this problem and really try and attack it. So. I'm so glad that she mentioned Dr. Calendar, um, Dr. Cloud Calendar and MoTeP at Howard University, yes. really yes. OG yes. Uh, in terms of, of this, this yes. advocacy yes. and in minority um, organ uh, transplant and, and tissue education program was where I learned um, a lot at the beginning um, of how yes. important it was to talk to our communities and to use my story and other people's stories to let people know just like you said that that transplantation is available and and edward i know your work is very much um community oriented and spreading the word and increasing awareness about um, organ donation transplantation so tell us about your journey no awesome and, and thank you so much uh donna for allowing me to be here it's truly an honor and uh while you all were speaking on, on, on MOTEP, uh, I got my start there as far as uh, branching outside my city back in Ohio where I was. Mm -hmm. um, I started I started being a spokesman for Cleveland MOTEP, ironically, for their teen summits mm -hmm. every year. So I did it for like eight years. So even when I left Ohio mm -hmm. and, and went to Georgia, I would still would go back and speak with the kids. So I got very, very fine memories. So uh, mm -hmm. a shout out to MOTEP. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah. yeah and, and uh, Dr. Golden, I was blown away by your, by your, uh, by everything you stated. So it's a pleasure to meet you as well. But um, from from my angle, uh, I didn't, I never expected to be in uh in organ transplantation or anything like that. Um, a lot of people ask me what I do, and I tell them uh, I work with kids who need organ and tissue transplants, and they're blown away. They like first right. organ tissue transplants, and then kids. They think, mm -hmm. they think you know, they're, they're not trying to hear more. But uh, right. But but then they asked me. They usually ask me, "How did you get into that?" Especially when I, I was a little mm -hmm. younger. Someone mm -hmm. so young like yourself get into that. 
and I'll start, I'll, I'll ask them, have you ever met someone who needed an organ transplant? And they say, they probably would say no. And I'm like, hi, my name is Edward Drake. And they'll look at me because at that time I had, yeah. I had muscles, you know, at that time mm -hmm. I, I was younger. I, <laughs> you, you needed a transplant or you are, are, are in need of a mm -hmm. transplant? And then I'll go share my story. I'll let them know I was about 19 or 20 when doing a routine physical that I, I found out mm -hmm. that my kidneys had completely shut down, um, not shutting down, but had completely shut down. Uh, so I was in college uh, pursuing my dream of both being the first college graduate in my family and uh, uh, and pursuing my dream of, of playing college athletics, which I worked so hard for when doing a routine physical. The doctor mm -hmm. was alarmed by my blood pressure reading, which was... This was about 16, 17 years ago. So it was about, uh, I think it was like 248 over like one something. And I just remember getting rushed to the hospital and sticking tubes in me everywhere. You know, I didn't really know what was going on. And I just remember a doctor coming in and looking at me kind of with a crazy look and saying, son, did you, do you know uh, your kidneys completely shut down? Like no one ever told you that you, you never had any signs of blood pressure, high blood pressure or anything like that? And I was like, no, because, you know, I would have to go get physical regularly. And, you know, they never mentioned anything about it. Usually, as I would say, they'll take you to the doctors, hit your knee, look in your ears, your nose, and, oh, you're fine. Get out of here. You know, you're, mm -hmm. oh, how old are you? 16, 17? Oh, you're fine. Get out of here. You know, mm -hmm. and then just this time, um, I just remember at that time, I was having a lot of weight gain and um, crazy itching sensation. So I was going to the doctor complaining about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're like, oh, you're fine. You're fine. You know, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm fine. And I was talking about, what about all the, the weight? They said yeah. it's muscle. So, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm walking around with my shirt off, like oh, I'm gaining muscle. But looking back on it, I was retaining water. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and then it just all came to, to a halt when, you know, when my blood pressure rose. And uh, then they did further testing and found out my kidneys had completely shut down. And I started dialysis the next day, which I did for three years prior to when X, mm -hmm. a stranger, said yes to becoming an organ and tissue donor. Her name is Leanne. She was deceased. So uh, thank you for. I thank her for that for that gift. So why not be a donor, especially during Donate Life Month? But uh, but yeah, but during during those three years on dialysis, I I just would ask the man above, why me? Why now? Everything that I worked so hard for, both in the classroom and in mm -hmm. athletics, came to instant halt. But uh, but in the mix of uh, me saying why me, I started volunteering at the other children's hospital. People were feeling sorry for me, like, wow, you're you're so young to be going through this, and I thought I was right. young. And I thought I was special up until I started going to visit the kids at the local children's hospitals. And there were mm -hmm. tons of kids going through similar issues, needing liver transplants, heart transplants, uh, cancers, everything else. So, you know, and seeing those kids really changed my life. You know, like here I am about 20 at the time. I thought my life was over because I couldn't join this fraternity or, or do this <laughs> and that or, you know, continue to pursue my uh, athletic career. But these kids weren't able to go to school. These kids weren't able to eat pizza on pizza days, you know, ride their bikes. Mm -hmm. so I stopped focusing, saying, why me? Then I started saying, why not me? Why not utilize this platform that I was given, that I was blessed with? Why not utilize the the, the education that I was able to retain to make a difference? So, you know, really, I stopped focusing on my on my problems and started focusing on my blessing and began impacting lives. And I never would have thought that a little organization that I founded over 15 years ago in a dialysis room will be impact would be impacting thousands of lives each year uh, of thousands of children and families. So I'm truly grateful to be here. And especially like in a minority community, we're not really educated about that. I truly feel, right. I truly feel that it shouldn't have took that. It shouldn't have took uh, something like my blood pressure being 248 for them to, uh, you know, for this issue to be caught. So I'm very passionate about not only helping the patients who are going through it, but trying to help prevent other youth from experiencing what myself and so many others. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm just thankful to be here and, and thankful to be on this, uh, on this amazing uh, podcast. Thank show. you. <laughs> we share a similar mission because, you know, having experienced end stage liver disease and transplantation, I feel like it's the, you know, purpose of my career to bring sort of everybody back so that 
um, things are prevented, that nobody has to experience that extent, that serious of disease um, to almost die. Uh, I was told, you know, or rather my parents were told because I was in the ICU, but they were told that I only had seven days to live. And so I, I never want someone else's parents to be told that um, about their child. And, uh, and I think prevention, when so much of, uh, so many of these issues that lead to the need for transplantation um, are are preventable, um, whether it's you know hypertension control, um, you know obesity um, control, um, you know understanding um, you know the signs of of liver disease earlier um, or the IBD. Uh, sometimes that that for for mine uh, coming from inflammatory bowel disease to to primary sclerosing sclerosing conjunctivitis to a liver transplant. Um, there are so many, you know, medical students who uh, who graduate thinking that people of color don't get IBD, so they, then they can never, of course, have autoimmune liver disease and, and never need a transplant. And so we really need to to pull the lens all the way back so that people are um, in care and then diagnosed earlier and and having the opportunity to prevent, um, you know, serious end stage renal or or liver disease. Um, so, you know, Nicole, I'd love to um, talk to you a little bit more about, you know, as you've been working with the communities, how, how do these messages about um, preventing uh, the need for, for transplantation, how, how do they sit and, and how can we think, um, you know, really more, more holistically and comprehensively about working with communities so that they never need a transplant, but that at least that they are connected and, and know if they, if they do. Yeah, I think <clears throat> for, for me, what I've learned the most is that the power lies within the community. And the community is so powerful. And it amazes me that I've gone this long <laughs> in my career without, I, I've always known it, but I have such mm -hmm. a respect for it now. Um, I'm just gonna give one example when we did, and I think Donna, you probably know this story, um, mm -hmm. but who've never heard it. Um, mm -hmm. We did a community outreach um, talking about transplant, among, among mm -hmm. other things. Um, mm -hmm community in East New York, um, in Brooklyn, and um, basically ask them what it is in your community that you would like to know about from a medical perspective, any disease, you name it. Mm -hmm. And um, there, were, there were questions about nutrition, diabetes, and things like that. And surprisingly, mm -hmm. organ transplant came up. You have to be very careful, as everybody knows, right? When you go into communities, especially communities of color, and you speak about right. transplant, Land. There's a certain delicacy and a certain mm -hmm. respect, and there, it just has to be approached very, um, it has to be approached uh, very respectfully. Let's just put it that way. Um, and so one of the questions was about organ transplant and donation. Mm -hmm. And we had um, our surgical director, um, you know, to do this talk, in addition to Bobby Howard, who is doing similar work uh, to mm -hmm. Edward. You know, I just love it. I love the community effort. Mm -hmm. um, and we discussed and went into a lot about what does the transplant process look like mm -hmm. um, and be a donor. And there were so many questions, like we couldn't keep up with the questions. Mm -hmm. And one particular lady that just kept asking questions about um, you know, if a person is is dead in the field, what we were called in the field, you know, how long are their organs still good? Are their organs mm -hmm. still good? Can you donate to anybody you want to? Can, mm -hmm. I, I, can I say I just want somebody black to get it? I mean, the questions were mm -hmm. amazing. Like, it, they were just like coming at us. Right. And little did we know that this woman's son had tragically passed away and was in a hospital bed. And she was asking all those questions and getting those answers. And it prepared her to make that decision towards organ donation. She donated five of his organs. And so five lives were saved through that. And I, I say that to say that all we did was show up and give the information that we so readily right. have. And the community just took it. And they, you know, they, they empowered themselves. And that particular community started like their own little transplant registry. Like people were calling and saying, mm -hmm. you know, 
kidney transplant. Can you put me on a list in case somebody mm -hmm. this? Um, So it opened up a whole new conversation for that community simply because they had the information. Um, and I remember back, you know, many, many years ago, right, when this work was starting about donations. Mm -hmm. And blacks were at the tail end of being organ donors. They did a pilot study. I can't remember. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. can the name of it, but they did a pilot study where they educated folks coming into the DMV, and the numbers right. went up astronomically. Mm -hmm. um, it just goes to prove that with the information and the time, I think there has to be investment and commitment right. and, tr and trust. And, and we can't approach like we're coming to tell you what to do, it's the approaches. Um, how can I help? Um, right. What can I do for you? Because I know you are very capable. Mm -hmm. I know you are empowered. What is it that you need me to do? And 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 I can assist with that. And um, I think that was just one of the most heartwarming stories that um, we've experienced so far. I think getting the information, the awareness part, um, and we always say like the four barriers that we actually were looking at was the awareness. Mm -hmm. Barriers. Do you know that transplant? That do you know what liver disease is? Right, starting right. from. The, do you, you know, know where your liver is? And people start reaching around. Like, no, no, it's up here. Exactly. It's up here. You only have one. <laughs> your liver does. Um, do you know that you know black people can have liver disease? Sometimes it's mm -hmm. that simple. Um, <clears throat> and do you know where to get help? Like, do you know who you should go to? Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times, people just they just don't have an idea. You know, right. and like my parents, for example, they'll go to the doctor, they'll have a whole hour appointment, and then they'll come home with like 50 million questions for me. Mm -hmm. And they're afraid or embarrassed mm -hmm. to ask questions because they're afraid of how they may be perceived. Um, right. you know, and they're very like, you know, um, you know, they're very prideful. <laughs> right. right. I, yeah. Exactly. What I was going to say they're very proud, yeah. and um, and we love that. You know, the yeah. dignity of our elders is so. Important. Um, yeah. And yeah. I just wanted to mention, people can ask questions uh, during the course of, uh, you know, of, of this conversation, um, whether you're watching it on Facebook or, or YouTube, on Twitter, you can send your questions. Um, and then our, you know, our behind the scenes staff will will uh, let us know so we can answer them um, in in real time here. So this too is a community conversation that is open, open to people. Um, you know, I'm so glad that you talked about, um, you know, uh, letting the, your, the registry that was sort of building because one of the things that uh, many people don't realize is that for kidneys, certainly, and for livers, um, living donation is a possibility and that, um, you know, the survival rate for people who receive um, living uh, donations is, is even higher. And, and so, um, you know, the reaction when, when, when people learn, learn that, um, that they can do that for a member of their, of their community um, is, uh, you know, I think is, is so powerful. We know we have um, one of our um, former, um, staffers at, at or former interns uh, for for the Global Liver Institute who is waiting for a kidney transplant. Um, she's hoping for a living donor. She's on, you know, every every possible list. And she had a recent article in um, in stat uh, publication called the organ procurement system is failing people of color like me. It's time for reform. Um, I encourage everyone to read it. It's 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 so powerful. Um, it, so it not only talks about how, um, you know, thirty though thirty percent of, of of organ donors are um, people of color, um, it can't make a dent in the fact that sixty percent of the list are are people of color, and so um, every uh, possible donor needs to be approached, and we need to hold the um, organ procurement system accountable uh, for their performance, you know for us, um, as well as for, for everyone else. And we can't allow them to, um, you know, shirk those responsibilities or, or, or hide in, in the data. Um, but there are disparities and inequities and problems at every, at every point in the system. So, you know, being awareness that aware that this is an option being asked to, to donate, um, being placed on, on the list, um, yeah. Uh, the figures I saw, I, I, I remember one one physician presenting on 
people dying while in the hospital. I always thought I'm like, okay, at least it's your safe place, at least for me, uh, you know, while in the hospital, they'll take care of everything, but that we still die at higher rates in the hospital. Um, and then once transplanted, um, our, our survival rates are still um, not as high as it would be for, for other populations. And so um, I think we each take, uh, you know, a, a different part of that of that puzzle but i think it's it's important for for people you know listening and and trying to partner with us us on um on these on these efforts that they know it's not just sort of one answer or one solution or one part of the system that it's it's the entire system um that is inequitable at every at every step and that's why we see the low rates um that we do so Edward, um, what's next for your organization? What are you, what are you, what are you planning? Uh, we just want to continue to, uh, like I said, address, address different issues that mm -hmm. not only like say enhance, but impact lives. It's, it's, uh, like what you, what you just stated about this, the, uh, the barriers and, and, and all that, that kind of, that kind of broke my heart because yeah, it's, it's very true. And, one thing that I, on a preventative side, one thing that I tell mm -hmm. tell these people who are non-patients and hopefully would never ever be patients is just because you get a transplant, don't think that, oh, I can abuse my body or do all this stuff and get a transplant. Right. Like, even when you get a transplant, it's never still this. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, as a transplant patient, I'm thankful, you know, I'm, I'm right. blessed, fortunate. But the medications that you have to take, you know, the... Uh, the things that I have to deal with sometimes be, be, being there talking to doctors and, and I know my stuff because I study, mm -hmm. right. I'm still, still various uh, physicians be feeling challenged because I'm asking them questions and you know, they mm -hmm. are you asking me, it's like so much to it, you know, like the insurances and, you know, you're doing all this while trying to help people. So, you know, um, but, but I say it kind of reminds me of why, at least from the philanthropic and why I started is mm -hmm. that, the need it was a need there i seen those kids who were stuck in those hospitals who kind of brought a tear to my eye and still still as we approach you know the situation is while trying to make the, the world a healthier place but also trying to help address some of these barriers i know what it's like if i could still be who i am and have the resources to be able to you know have the resources and i still can get treated like at times like you know what what mm -hmm. can who, don't have that same education or who don't have those same resources, who don't have those same connections, what are they going to go through? You know, mm -hmm. it's just, I don't know. So, so, so in a nutshell, really just trying to, like I said, um, through our very, our current program service, continue to try to impact more lives, uh, mm -hmm. uh, give, out, give out more scholarships, um, help more families, prevent more families and patients from going through what myself and so many others are across the country. Uh, 107,000, I believe, uh, people are currently awaiting a, organ transplant and uh I'm, I'm trying to think it changed so much i've been in i've been in a while uh but i know we appreciate yeah, that you know it, it wasn't long you know we think about um the first liver transplant being in 1967 and, and kidney transplantation starting in the same type of the era and um and it's not just the surgery um it was the medications it was um developing the immunosuppressive um, regimens um, that you and I are both, <laughs> both, yeah. both on, and um, and and access to those medications um, is an important part of um, a successful transplant. You know, I know that um, the, the the look on my face when they when they told my parents, and you know, we had good insurance. Um, you know, famous last words, we had good insurance <laughs> of so many people, but my parents were both school teachers, they were in a union, you know, they had an insurance that had enabled me to get all the testing and treatment and the transplant, but still there was a very large copay for the 17 different medications that I was on immediately post-transplant. And there was a there was a check. It was well over a thousand dollars that they needed to write just as the copay for that first batch of medications before they could take me home. Um, and I don't know where they found them. I think some aunts and uncles and everyone contributed to to 
helping to get me just sprung out of the hospital for the first, uh, you know, with the first, um, you know, batch of, of medications. And so when we think about how to ensure that someone has the opportunity for transplant and is successful on transplant, um, I think the supports that we need to look to now are about um, housing for the family if they have to go to a transplant center that's not close to home. And so the, um, there aren't enough transplant houses, um, you know, that are you know dedicated to, to to families who are who are waiting near the near their center. So we need to scale those services and the social workers and others who are there in those transplant houses to um, to answer those questions. Nicole, as you said, that yes, come after the visit. Um, and I, I think we need to make sure that people have um, uh, financial support for the medications. It's a little different in, in, in kidney disease because the ESRD program does pay for you know immunosuppressants for a number of months. And we still need to make sure that they, you know, that those are um, for life. Um, of the of the transplant, but for liver and other types of um, transplants, our immunosuppressants aren't you know paid for in the same in the same way as comprehensively. And so, um, and then getting back to work or school and not being able to work while you recover your caregiver needs. I think there's a a lot that we can do to um, support uh, people and and help their network um, support them so that one, they'll be viewed by the um, transplant hospitals as good candidates, um, but that they'll also have um, as good a chance as anybody else who's better resourced um, to be successful in that transplant. Um, you know, Nicole, in, in, in the process, uh, you know, at your hospital and, and in the work that you're doing with your organization, um, is that type of uh, part of the equity equation to, uh, you know, ensure that people have the network and support systems and the financial systems um, so that they can be considered good, good candidates and, um, you know, be approved for transplantation and then be successful afterwards. Yes, um, that's definitely part of the process. Um, we've had you know, cases where it's a fight, like you said, to get the um, the medications approved. And sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, you experience that after the transplant, right? Everything's mm -hmm. going for a few months, then something happened. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the primary insure, insure um, switch jobs or is laid off, mm -hmm. things happen. So those are definitely <laughs> challenges that we've had to um, come across and deal with. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's like you're fighting for your child. <laughs> You know, um, and I always I always say like to, to my patients, like we are family, right? Mm -hmm. We continue to follow you forever. Mm -hmm. um, and so we tackle those challenges together. Um, but it is definitely a challenge. And I have to say, thank God it hasn't been that frequent um, more recently. Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely an improvement um, in that in that perspective. In terms of, yeah. And there's also been improvements in the transplant medications. It's exciting to see research in those areas to make sure that I, as a liver transplant recipient, don't end up needing a kidney transplant um, as, as, as well. Um, and so um, as I'm, you know, very um, cognizant of my of my kidney health as well. And that's, I think that's something that, you know, Edward, you, you pointed out that you know, transplantation isn't the end of the story. You're not just like, okay, we're good, we're done. Yeah. You know, we're gonna go off. Um, it really is a, um, you know, it's an it's an exciting uh, responsibility to have, but it is a responsibility to take your medications and to exercise and to keep yourself well and to monitor, you know, your cardiovascular health and your renal health and your liver health all together so that you can last as long as possible. Um, with with an organ and so what types of things do you do you look you look really good <laughs> what types of things do you do as former athlete that you are to optimize your your gift of life first and foremost i pray you know i'm not a man i'm not ashamed you know i'm not i'm not ashamed of my, of my faith because i truly wouldn't be here without without it because i mean you know what they say thank thank god i don't look like what i've been through because whoo yeah. you know like I said, <laughs> 
how you were just talking about um mm-hmm. like about the kidney health how I I, I still see a hematologist to make sure, you know, mm-hmm. those levels, because we take all these medications and mm-hmm. you know, like, like I had about to skin cancer due to, you know, African-Americans are mm-hmm. just not at a higher risk of skin okay. cancer because of our, our, uh, our melanin, but mm-hmm. you know, due to some of the medications that, you know, I want, I want to go into it, but due to some of the medications, you know, I was having skin cancers and it took, a, mm-hmm. took, took a while for, for, for me to get off these medications, which, you know, which, I haven't dealt with it since, but you know, it's just so much. So now they got to monitor different levels. So just never know. So, so mental wellness, I do a lot of things like mental mm-hmm. wellness, but, but the most important thing is, you know, I got purpose, you know, like when you, when you know you're here for a purpose, my mm-hmm. whole thing is just to rather through, through our foundation or through our other businesses, mm-hmm. it's just like, like, like our, 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 our business that I'm real passionate about is called why not me enterprises. It started as mm-hmm. a why, a, a why not with a, the foundation help people, but now the next mm-hmm. people know that you're more than a patient. Right. While, while I might have lost my dream of being this Nike executive or you know or, or being this professional athlete, have a foundation. I, I created other businesses. I, I, I know. Mm-hmm. I know. You know. I'm, I'm more than a patient. Don't categorize me. Don't categorize me. Mm-hmm. But most importantly, I'm trying to inspire these other kids that if I can do it, why not you? Mm-hmm. Why not? I mean, it don't matter what you go through. You know, every a test is a testimony. So now it's just like I'm on I'm on a purpose. I'm on a driven. I'm like, hey, if I'm I hope I live a hundred years, but if I I don't know. But while I'm here, why not utilize all my my talents, my gifts, everything that the that the man above have has blessed me with to make a difference. And and you know, and that's what I'm all about now, rather through speaking, rather through writing books, rather through mm-hmm. starting agencies, rather through uh helping other people start, you know, it, that's what I'm all about now because like I said, I'm not Sometimes it is scary to sit back and think like, you know, like what can happen, but you know, you never know. Like, why are you thinking about here worrying? You can go outside and get hit by a bus. You just never know. You know, you just never know. So, so, I mean, I don't know. It's not a, you know, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. I agree. I start, I start with prayer as well. And, you know, I've always loved the name of your organization because my, the minister I, I grew up with, um, he also he had a sermon. He must have given it at least once a year. But it it really was, you know, why not you? You know, right. any of us could be afflicted with so many different things. What were you going to do about it? How are you going to rise to uh, you know the circumstances that God has placed in your life and use them to serve and use them for a purpose? And so it's so wonderful that you have. I think it's also really wonderful that you speak to young people and provide scholarships and other direction. Most people don't realize that young people can get liver disease or such severe kidney disease. And so I think that's part of the story and the start of the awareness um, and the destigmatization of of our conditions. Um, No, it really can be anyone. you know, for uh, you know, the young woman who I was talking about um, just a while ago, her she had a you know genetic uh, kidney disorder, and I think her first treatments were when she was seventeen. Um, and you know, I was first diagnosed at age thirteen, and you were you know very young as well. And so this isn't just something that happens to those people over there who've done something bad. This is really, you know, any anyone, um, and that's why the story of you know donation is so important. That because it's everybody needs to be part of this part of this story because anyone could could need an organ um, at some point for for some for some reason. Um, Absolutely, Nicole, and if I can add, if I can yeah. add this, like I tell people all the time when they complain, just go to go to your local hospital, go to your local funeral. Somebody's mm-hmm. crying a loved one go to your lo- local hospital somebody is going through i was at a children's hospital and my tears drop every time i see i seen a little girl walking out here with no hair evidently she's going through cancer now i was walking another kid's room it's like i don't know it's kind of like that stuff it, it keeps me it keeps things in perspective for me you know keep things right. like life is all about perspective you can sit here and complain about you just you can't control but you can walk mm-hmm. in any hospital like i said somebody crying somebody prison somebody's i mean it's just like so many people out here suffering, but when you live in your bubble, your own little bubble, and think it's mm-hmm. you know, it can't happen to. I mean, whew, life life has a way of showing you. So sorry, life has a way, what they say. Stay humble when you when you're up, 
Mm-hmm. Stay, you know what I mean? And stay prayerful when you're going through it and have faith because you know life has the seasons and you just never you just never know. You just ne- you just never know. So don't never think why not you because just never know. It could be any. It, it may not be organ failure. It may not be liver failure. Mm-hmm. It, may, it could be anything. So just stay thankful. So sorry, I just wanted to add that. Stay humble. No, stay. that's okay. If the spirit moves you, I'm gonna just gonna let it move and just gonna stay out of the yeah. way. I think that's I think that's right. Um, and you know, and if this conversation is used for that purpose, um, that that is that is a blessing, and 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 I will have I will have served. I think this is the conversation that that people need it, it's honest it's authentic this is what we go through and this is to you know to know that people care about them you can i've been in that hospital room and it gets very lonely during the day sometimes you know you, you get excited when a, a nurse or a tech or somebody will come by but sometimes when um in the days that you're not actively falling apart it can get very lonely and so for people to know that there are folks like us who are thinking about them every day in our morning prayers, in our evening prayers, and in the middle, we're actively trying to fix the system so that they get the care that they need, you know, the best care, the best innovations, the next, you know, Tom Starzl um, funded to do research on, um, you know, advances for people of color, advances to help people not need a transplant or, you know, um, it was excited to read about warm perfusion um, uh, techniques that enhance the, you know, the effectiveness of the and the longevity um, of a liver. And so encouraging the research um, and hopefully research by an increasingly diverse workforce in nursing, um, in, uh, in 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 nephrology, in gastroenterology, in hepatology, so that we can have um, you know physicians of color um, who understand our communities, who understand our concerns, and and can communicate to us in ways uh, and uh, encourage us in ways that resonate with us. I think that's all part of this um, you know equity uh, you know solution as well. Um, Nicole, how can we have more uh, black transplant nurses? How can we have more wonderful, wonderful nurses like you? So that, that I, you know, I, as I was listening to the word, um, it just, it just brought back um, a pilot program that, um, mm-hmm. that we did over the summer, um, the Black Liver Health Initiative. We mm-hmm. did a program where we had about 35 young black men um, and we sent them through a one week pilot program of going into the hospital, going and seeing colonoscopies. Mm-hmm. It was very challenging, you know, to mm-hmm. do with the pandemic. Um, mm-hmm. And the goal was to expose them and make them aware, mm-hmm. right? This is medicine and this is something that you can do. Um, right. And they had, everybody had a lab jacket with their name on it, they had a stethoscope. I mean, mm-hmm a swag bag, Donna. I mean, it was amazing. And I have to say, you know, thank you for all the, everyone that really assisted us in in getting that done. Um, But it's that, it takes that, Mm -hmm. right? There is a, there is a deficit of black physicians, black surgeons. Mm -hmm. Um, We have more females than we have males. Worse Mm -hmm than it was before. It was actually better before. So where are we going? What are we doing? And so mm-hmm. like, doing pipeline programs like that, where if we get, and again, we expose them to mm-hmm. distance surgery, nursing, of course, we had to represent nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, mm-hmm. like a, a bunch of different medical fields, just really exposing them to show them that this is something you can do. So maybe two years from now, when they're, mm-hmm. you know, thinking about what they're going to do in life and that white mm-hmm. lap hanging in their closet with their name. And, and they remember me saying paging, paging Dr. Edward, you know, that's ah. how we, um, they'll remember this experience and be motivated um, um, to, to come into the healthcare because representation mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Um, and it's been proven in studies that patients are more compliant when mm-hmm. they, have, you know, providers that look like them, um, right. you know, patients who would call me and say, what should I do? And they're asking me about cardiac questions. I'm like, I sent you to the best cardi- cardiac. <laughs> oh, no, right. Do I say, you know, I don't know. But, um, but it just goes to show that, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, right? Because we mm-hmm. have 
so many healthcare providers that really do love and care about all patients. And I, and that's the majority right. of us. Um, but it is unfortunate that it is that way, but we have, mm -hmm. to, we have to rise to the need. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some people, we, we may be ch able to change the way they think, but, you know, some of them we won't be able to. Um, right. So we have to really try and work on those type of things. And it starts with baby steps. Um, like Edward, mm -hmm. I am so overwhelmed a lot when I look at all the things you're looking at. Um, I look at some, you know, some inner city kids and I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I could do something. You know, mm -hmm. it becomes overwhelming. Um, and then I sit down and I said, okay, I'm going to choose the the part that I can that I can help with, but there is so much going on in the world, and mm -hmm. which there's so much for every one of us to do, right? It's an right. opportunity. Um, so, but I think that's part of how we can increase the the pathway of getting minority doctors, nurses into mm -hmm. the field. Um, just really putting it out there that this is doable. There are straight up people that just don't feel it's something that they can do, and it's such a disservice because we have such bright, talented. Um, young kids that would be amazing at doing this, you know? Um, so yeah, we just have to keep chipping away. I agree. Oh, I'd love to, um, I'd love to extend that another pilot program. Uh, you know, it, it's a straight through line to my father had um, worked with um, a, a local attorney back home in, in, in Connecticut. He's now a, now a judge. Uh, um, on a uh, called Granville Academy, and and uh, I, they did so many wonderful programs. Um, but my my father and his Black History Jeopardy was <laughs> was the part that I that I really uh, you know remember and, and enjoy the most. But the just the dedication of their time and their mentorship to young people to let them know that careers in education or law or medicine were, yeah. were for them, mm -hmm. uh, were possible for them is, is so important. Um, you know, I, I often talk about the, you know, the greatest gift that my parents gave me was a feeling of belonging that um, whatever boardroom or what have you that I walk into, I know that I belong. And, and so that's a great feeling uh, to be able to create and, and inculcate in, in, our young, in our young people. Um, besides, you know, diversity is great, being included is, is great, um, being represented, being in the room, but feeling like you belong there, that all of the resources are for you, that we're gonna have to dig a little deeper um, to impart that to this next generation. And I certainly want to be a part of that. Yeah. So, so transplantation is certainly something that should belong to to everyone, um, and yet you know we know the statistics. Uh, you know the needs are higher. Um, you know one and a half times higher for for Hispanics, uh, three times higher um, for African Americans, and and yet we don't we don't get those we don't get the transplants, um, and so it seems like this is this is the group that we need to grow uh, and, and start on and uh, make sure that the legacy of, uh, of Dr. Callender and, and Dr. Johnson, who is um, still in the, on the battlefield, <laughs> on the front lines, uh, he must be uh, still in that transplant. I, I'm, I'm so excited that uh, we may have to update the show notes so that people know like, how'd that transplant go? Um, I'm sure it went well, it's incredible hands. I remember when Dr. Johnson, started because uh, um, I used to staff him when I uh, was uh, on, on staff at UNOS you know, after my own transplant and uh, um, when he was at Georgetown and, and started that transplant institute which is now you know one of the largest and most prestigious and and now going over to GW to make sure that um, there is even more access within within this city um, that still has high, such a high um, you know, percentage of, of African Americans here in Washington, D.C., um, who have a host of conditions, particularly in wards seven and eight, um, that, uh, you know, disproportionately uh, lead them to needing transplants. So the fact that there are more transplant resources in the city of Washington is is something that's exciting. Um, 
but it seems we need to scale um, some of the community-based innovations that you're working on, Nicole, and that, Edward, you were working on um, to make sure that people have everything that they need. Um, I'm really, I'm really so excited that um, you could be here. So as we think, as we leave uh, April, um, and, and I think, you know, every month is Donate Life Month, of course, and I think every month is Minority Health Month. But, um, you know, as, as we leave um, April, um, what is um, one thing that you want people to, to take away or one thing that you want them to do um, to help uh, resolve some of the inequities that we have been discussing? Um, Edward, I'll, I'll go to you first, and I'll, I'll, I'll let Nicole have the have the last word. Whew. That, that's uh, whew. that's a good. I question. know you have several things, but that's, it could be to you know participate in your in the next event for your organization, yeah. or it can be uh, you know a particular type of volunteering. What what would you most want people to to just, do? I would just simply, I would just say impact lives and you know impact lives in whatever arena you're gifted you know like i said we're mm -hmm. all gifted in different areas so you know mm -hmm. just find, find a way to make a difference whether it's uh if you don't have resources you may have time if you don't got time you got this we all got something to give what they say we all can give something right we all you know we all can be great because we all can serve right so, yes. uh, so yeah, I just like find some, like find a way to serve, find a way mm -hmm. to get back, find find a way to, uh, to do something for someone who can never repay you. You know, like right. I said, and um, and and you'll be and you you'll be surprised. Like I tell people, I tell the, I tell, I tell kids all the time is don't if you don't focus on the money, the money will come. If you focus on what you love, or you focus on mm -hmm. you know focus on making a difference, the, the money will the money. And the uh, notoriety, all that, it'll it'll find you. So right. I mean, don't, don't don't do it, don't do it for don't do it for applause. Do it for a call. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell everyone just to find a way to find a way to uh, yeah, do something for someone who can never repay you. So yeah, I love that, Nicole. I I'm gonna echo. Sorry, Edward. I'm gonna steal that too. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly. I want to like I want to write that down. <laughs> don't do it for the applause. Do it for the cause. But I, I agree. Um, we are all gifted. You know, God has given us all these talents um, and passions and gifts. Um, and we've, you know, developed those gifts, right? We get the gifts, but we have to develop them and mm -hmm. being consistent and putting the time in. And I think that wherever that gift is, wherever that developed talent is, we have to give it back. Um, right. You know, it's, it, We gain nothing by holding on to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, and I think that's what every, everyone on this, um, on this, uh, podcast, everyone, that's kind of what our goal is. Um, so I just implore with everyone watching, um, to do that. Um, never think of yourself as being too little to give. Um, it's at the time when we need the most that we should give. <laughs> it sounds mm -hmm. like a paradox, but it's so true. Um, mm -hmm. and I always say whenever I give, whether it's my time, you know, finance, whatever it is, or if it's just a smile, I always mm -hmm. get so much back more that feeds my soul. Um, and it stays with me for a long time. Um, I, you know, when I was, you know, thinking about, you know, Dr. Starzl and some of the things he said, and he commented that, you know, when his mother was ill, he had this feeling of what's the word impotence. And mm -hmm. I think we all get that way sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we feel like, my God, what can I do? Um, and it can feel overwhelming. But if we just mm -hmm. take a bit away, you know, many hands make light work. Um, if we all chip a little bit away at that big boulder, whatever it is that we're mm -hmm. with, it, you know, organ equity and transplant, organ access, if we all put in something, we will mm -hmm. pull something out of it. And how much more would that benefit? Uh, people who need organ transplants, you know, I'm, I'm still amazed to this day of what of what a gift, you know, organ transplantation is and what mm -hmm. our doors are, um, deceased and living. Um, so, I, I, you know, I feel like I can't do enough. Um, mm -hmm. to, to, you know what I mean? I feel like whatever I do, sometimes I feel like it's not enough because this is so much bigger than me. Um, right. And I 
to keep rising to the occasion. And if that means making sure, like Edward was saying, um, you know, you got to take care of your body, you know, after mm -hmm. that, your kidneys, you know, your kidneys can be compromised from the mm -hmm. medication. We actually started, I actually developed a course called Pulse Transplant Life. Um, oh. Patient, patient and provider responsibility. And mm -hmm. that, um, in our pre-transplant education course, I think number one, it gives a nice glimpse of what transplant looks like to those right. waiting. It could be hard waiting. Mm -hmm. um, also addresses all those things um, that Edward was talking about. So really just putting in the time and giving back um, is what I would say. And and Donna, thank you for doing this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we definitely need more forums like this um, mm -hmm. to not to, I, I hate to say educate, but to make the information available. Right. Um, because there's life in information sharing. There's literally life in information sharing. So thank you. I agree. Thank you. I'm going to uh, just give a few tips um, to people, small, small and large things that people can do today. Um, you know, uh, indicate that you want to register as an organ donor on, at your GMV, um, or you can even Facebook has an option where you can um, uh, indicate that you want to become an organ donor. And that's, I want to say, not some nefarious Facebook thing. That's because um, Cheryl Sandberg, the COO, talked with um, her class of 91 uh, classmate, um, Dr. Andrew Cameron. And he said, how can we reach the most number of people and, and give them the opportunity to donate? And so two college classmates got together and, and were able to make that um, option available on social media. So um, it could be easier for people. We, talk to your family about your um, desire to donate because you may not be near your driver's license or, or some other document that um, you intend to donate. Um, there are opportunities to um, do talks about organ donation with your local um, uh, transplant organization and organ procurement um, organization. Um, I was a transplant spokesperson um, afterwards, um, but you can do that even before your transplant. Um, for the Global Liver Institute, we have opportunities if you want to learn more about how to um, work on organ transplant policy and these access issues we have. We have training for people um, in our Advanced Advocacy Academy that you can sign up for on our website. More locally, we have members of our Liver Action Network um, that you can volunteer for and, and, and with and, and help in your local communities. Um, and uh, of course, we have our, 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 all, of our, all of our policy um, initiatives that you can sign up just to know and just even sign your name to a letter saying that you want the organ procurement system to be more fair and you want CMS and, and HRSA to hold um, people accountable so that every possible person has an opportunity um, for this miracle of transplant that that Dr. Starzl uh, ignored so many other people's opinions about it and was so persistent and 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 so resilient um, on our behalf. Let's make sure that um, it's not just the the burden of genius, uh, but it's uh, you know this equitable. Um, uh, process um, that can give life uh, to not only the recipient, but as he would often say, everybody who uh, the recipient's life touched, everybody who loved them uh, benefits uh, from from transplantation. So thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you to my guests and, and thank you and blessings to Dr. Johnson where he's saving a life actively as, as we talk. So we look forward to welcoming the next uh, liver transplant recipient into the GLI family. Um, until next time, thank you.